Hello and Namaste everyone. Wish you a very, very beautiful Ganesh Chaturthi on the occasion of Ganesh Chaturthi. We've recorded this very, very special podcast with you, with Manoj Pavitran. In this podcast, we will be exploring about the significance of Ganesha from a deeper, inner, yogic, psychological perspective. While we have a lot of stories about Ganesha out there, we have this wonderful festival and rituals around Ganesha. But what really is Ganesha? And when on the path of yoga, you're getting attracted to to Lord Ganesha, what does it truly mean? What is the significance? What is the deeper significance of Ganesha? And how can one invoke his force in one's everyday life? So with that perspective, we've recorded this podcast for you. And this podcast goes through different terrains. But at the end of the podcast, there is such a beautiful, refined, a sense of Ganesha that we are able to arrive at, that it's so breathtaking, that it's so powerful, that I want you to watch the podcast till the very end. So with that, now we care in to listen to the podcast. So Manoj, last year when we were going to Pichavaram, it was around Ganesh Chaturthi and we had this wonderful conversation on Ganesha. It was really last year that I started being attracted to Ganesha and it's a bit funny because I grew up in a household where my mother was like a big fan of Lord Ganesha. She loved to you know, buy the little, little idols of Ganesha and that was the most wonderful gift for her. And she wanted to buy Ganesha in different, different mudras. So she was really somebody who collected the idols of Ganesha. And in fact, she gifted me a Ganesha when I moved into my house as well. But until that point in time, for me, Ganesha really represented my mother. It's a God that my mother relates to. It was really only last year that Ganesha really started to come in my consciousness and I started to develop a certain relationship with uh, Ganesha. And as I kind of see, you know, in my journey, um, I came to Sri Bindu and the mother and in the beginning I was attracted to nature, the sky. I was really attracted to, in a certain sense, impersonality of the divine. And then slowly in the path of yoga, started getting attracted to Krishna, the aspect of love. And Krishna really is the deity of my home in a certain sense. And really the deity which is the most closest to me. And then I saw uh, in my life when work had to really you know, take off. At that time, I was really attracted to Kali. Mm -hmm. And uh, in a certain sense, if I look at it from an integral yoga psychology perspective, it's like the force moving from the mind to the heart, to the fire in the belly, which is, you know, when it was the force in the mind, then it was about impersonality of the divine. And in the heart, it became the personality of the divine, the Krishna, the joy, the delight, the beauty of Krishna, the love of Krishna. And then the fire in the belly, the Kali dimension started to appeal to me. And lately, you know, I was really sensing that it's the subconscious that we call as the Pata Lok, you know. That was the part which was getting processed in the process of yoga happening uh, through my life. And when you mentioned that Ganapati is the lord of the Ganas, it was a big aha moment I understood as to why, you know, Ganesha is coming to me at this stage of life. We have, you know, a lot on the internet which talks about the symbology of the Ganesha nowadays, even Ganesha for management and all of that is there. But I really felt like a need for something on the internet which is talking about really the truth, the essence of Ganesha 
from a yogic perspective what does it mean that if at this stage of life you're getting attracted to the presence or the consciousness of ganesha what does it mean for you what what does he represent what is he what is his energy and so that we when we you know celebrate ganesh chaturthi it's not just about the rituals that we do but about a deeper sense of connection with the presence of ganesha so with that i hope that's a good point to start and uh, over to you yes that's really fascinating to see the movement from top downward it's a very typical movement hmm. from upper regions going down and the interesting part about ganesha is he is referred to as someone who is residing in the muladhara mm. that is the root chakra mm. which is the seat of physical consciousness mm. according to our integral mm. psychology integral yoga mm. framework that is the seat of physical consciousness it is the chakra system is part of the tantric mm. knowledge mm. and we can see the reference to ganesha or mm. not ganesha ganapati mm. in the vedas very early on but that is referring to brahmanaspati as ganapati and in the journey of going into the subconscious and in that battle they are invoking ganapati the one who is the lord of the ganas hmm. so what is happening psychologically is something that we need to really hmm. understand when we are referring to ganesha Mm. and getting drawn to different symbols mm. Mm. like uh, we have the outer material world and then there is a inner mm. psychological world mm. and the inner transformation requires a kind of a symbolic language to understand mm. so in india we have hundreds of symbolic way of looking at things mm. Mm. like ganesha is traveling on a mouse mm-hmm. now we are not dealing with physics and chemistry here we are dealing with something symbolic mm. so in that journey downward mm. in our own transformation we learn first concepts in the mind mm. then the heart mm. is yeah accepting this is what i really would like to go forward with mm. and then it comes down to finally dealing with everyday life the way it is unfolding that is where we need to really make change mm. because the inner is reflected in the outer mm. and in the outer and inner merging mm. this is where the muladhara the physical consciousness come into the picture mm. this is where uh, it is a seat of we can say stability mm. and that is where things are consolidated Mm. the mass mm. the material substance the physical our body mm. our body has a consciousness of its own mm. so body is also result of food mm. you know it's anna maya kosha mm. actually if i can interrupt yeah. manoj yeah. it will be nice for our viewers also if you can run them through the different chakras in that context you know they will make more sense out of what muladhara is in the representation of ganapati and also you in the passing mentioned about brahmanaspati uh, from the vedas what is that dimensional so i'd like to know more uh-huh. and yeah. Uh, yeah i think that will give a bit more mm-hmm. of a context uh, to our viewers yes so the whole chakra framework is our ancient indian psychology framework hmm. but it is not that ancient mm. it is during the tantric period this was developed mm. Mm. that is roughly 1500 mm. years mm. Mm. ago but the vedas is more than 3500 4000 years old mm. at that time there was no reference to chakras mm. and also there was no temples deity worship mm. nothing they had a direct relationship with the forces of nature mm. for them forces of nature were conscious forces with whom they can engage with mm. and the outer world and the inner world mm. the psychology mm. and the cosmology were mm. together mm. Mm. 
so was the theology theology of the knowledge of the gods mm. so they were having direct relationship with the gods mm. and collaborating with them and the journey of mm. this evolution of consciousness who, who was brahmanaspati then brahmanaspati is that power of word that mm. creates okay from the source mm. there is a creative word the power mm. of mantra mm. and brahmanaspati is the one who is the lord of that mm. who creates by the power of word mm. so in the journey into the cave where the treasures of higher consciousness are hidden mm. in that journey mantra is their power and they need to get the right word mm. and there is a battle with the opposing forces mm. the opposition on the journey mm. and you need the right word the right knowledge hmm. with which you can enter but i'm and still not clear yeah. we have brahmanaspati how is brahmanaspati connected with ganapati if you can take us through that that will so help. one is uh, the power of word itself hmm. to create hmm. the pure vibration that when we enter into these caves hmm. so at that in the vedic period any godhead hmm. if you enter through that you will discover all other godheads hmm. it, it it was very fluid hmm. like ganapati hmm. what is referred is also pointing towards brahmanaspati hmm. and also it can really it can become agni because in the journey agni is also coming in hmm. so they had a much more fluid mind that was playing with different aspects mm, mm. and it is when it is going into the physical consciousness mm. the invocation to the ganas come into the picture but brahmanaspati is still providing the mantras the word mm. all that but then the ganapati form or again we cannot use the word form mm. because the form of ganesha as we know it mm. did not exist at that time Mm, mm. it is a later creation mm. because they were directly dealing with the forces of nature mm. so there is this creative word mm. that is coming in mm. and it is entering into the subconscious mm. and this is where subconscious is the muladhara is so in there. some ways can we say that ganesha is the creative word in the subconscious and which is why he is referred to as the lord of the spiritual knowledge And that's an interesting way to link bridge the two mm. because there is creative word across mm. Mm. and ganesha is specific to physical consciousness muladhara mm. and annamaya kosha mm. where in the corresponding consciousness where there again the word is necessary mm. the right word is necessary to engage with that terrain which is below the reason Hmm. that yeah. leads me back to my another question i had hmm. could you run us through the chakras and then go let's go more deeper into the muladhara ha okay. huh. so let's say we can classify chakras into three groups hmm. the mind related hmm. chakras so hmm. vishuddhi chakra ajna chakra and sahasradala opening upward so this is all corresponding to the mind hmm. Hmm. and then there are three chakras corresponding to the pranamaya hmm. there is a heart chakra there is hmm. solar plexus and the one below swadeshana yeah hmm. swadeshana these three correspond to the pranamaya kosha so yeah. manomaya kosha and the mind then the vital then comes the physical that is where the muladhara and hmm. that physical all the way to the subconscient hmm. so that is ruling over that hmm. so the three chakras above is ruling over the pranamaya hmm. the vital energy hmm. and, and what is the vital energy if you can also share a little bit about that so anything that is to move in the world requires energy to move hmm. so the vitality the flow of energy the like hmm. breath is a manifestation of vital hmm. electricity is a manifestation of the vital and it is all there happening in the body and it is animating everything that there is an animating energy and force so if nature. i can summarize we have the center of our being which is usually we operate as ego and as we deepen into the path then that center of identity shifts from ego to the soul and that soul has three major instruments one is the mind 
And these are the three chakras corresponding to the mind. The second is the vitality, which is the life energy. And these are the three chakras corresponding to the vitality. And then we have the body. And Ganesha is the... Lord seating, presiding over the physical, physical consciousness, consciousness Annamaya Kosha, body. and it's yeah, huh. body consciousness, its own wisdom, its own intelligence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So therefore, we can also see Ganesha is also associated with food. Mm -hmm. Which is why the Modaks. Ah. Uh, so the Annamaya Kosha, and mm -hmm. it is also the one who, like Gana simply means grouping, okay. bringing things together. Mm -hmm. And even if you want to bring people together, food. <laughs> now, food brings everyone together and there is Shanti. Once food is taken care of, well fed, when, no, when your tummy is full, you are ready for everything else. So Ganesha is presiding over that uh, function of bringing people together. Okay. And not just people, hmm. people is when we talk in terms of society. Hmm. Hmm. If we are to gather in strength, hmm. we need to cluster. Hmm. Hmm. When you cluster, you have the power to move any obstacles, hmm. remove any obstacles hmm. on the way. Hmm. So like in 19th century, hmm. Tilak, Logmanya Tilak, hmm. he found Hmm. that here we have the British colonized rule happening. Hmm. It's a major obstacle. Hmm. This has to be removed. Hmm. Now, how do you remove it? Hmm. You need to, he invoked Ganapati. Hmm. That's how he introduced the public festival of Ganesha, hmm. which used to be a small homebound Mm -hmm. celebration mm -hmm. but the reason why he chose that was Ganesha was dear to all groups of people mm -hmm. across caste system mm -hmm. and with Ganesha he can bring people together mm -hmm. so he created a public festival mm -hmm. and since then it had been going on in Maharashtra in a very big way mm -hmm. and it brought people together mm -hmm. and when you come together there is the strength mm -hmm. of the group Hmm. That's why it is also now coming back in uh, management. Hmm. Like Ganesha brings, like what brings people together or things together? Hmm. Unless you bring things together hmm. and so, some forces to preside over that bringing together, hmm. No? Hmm. you cannot have that greater power with which you can move and cross over obstacles. I'd like to go back to, like we are talking about Ganesha as the force that bringing things together. Now, holding. holding and bringing things together. Yeah. How does that relate to yoga in the subconscious and the work with the Muladhara Chakra? That uh, I want to explore a bit more deeper mm. from the yogic perspective. Yeah, this is where the old story of the fight between father and son, Ganesha and Shiva, mm. that come into mm. very interesting uh, perspective. The story is uh, Ganesha was created by Parvati out of her own body mm. and she was not there at home mm. and he was out mm. and she asked Ganesha to guard mm. her house and uh, when Shiva returned here is this one mm. newborn who is guarding mm. the house and he wouldn't let Shiva enter and then comes a battle between the two. Mm. And Shiva cuts his head off and then later yeah. replaces it with the head of an elephant. That's the story. But psychologically, what does it mean? Mm. This is a battle that every one of us has to face mm. internally. Mm. For example, physical consciousness, we know it's a dharma is to hold. Mm. Like you create a habit. Mm. Creation of it, like, unless something is repeated multiple times, hmm. it won't form. Once it is formed, physical consciousness, subconscious will hold it. Hmm. Because it's dharma is hold a form. Hmm. So it obeys very obediently. He is a very obedient child of hmm. the mother nature. Hmm. Hmm. Because mother nature has to create forms out of 
nothing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Out of vacuum, mm -hmm. she has to create, build the worlds and mm -hmm. create forms. Someone has to hold mm -hmm. and grouping. Mm -hmm. Like with atoms coming together to create molecules, molecules coming together to create cells, and then the whole body is created, the clustering has to be mm -hmm. held. Mm -hmm. So Ganesha presides over it. It's mm -hmm. born out of her own nature. Mm -hmm. It's a very material substance all clustered and held mm -hmm. together, and he presides over it. And his job is to ensure that that form is held in place. Mm -hmm. He will obey her completely. Mm -hmm. But he is not aware of who is his father. That is the higher consciousness. Ah, like the physical consciousness, the body not being aware that actually inside the body itself lies the tattva of the divine, that it is made of the divine itself. And that is what Shiva probably represents as yeah. the divine presence or the divine uh, father, that right. actually the body exists, the matter divine. exists because of the spirit, but the matter is forgotten that the matter exists because of the spirit, right? Right. right. Ah. So psychologically now you you have a past evolution mm -hmm. and an established set of habits, mm -hmm. bundles all gathered. You have a sense of identity gathered or collection of memories. Mm -hmm. All your emotions, identities, everything is an accumulation. The story that we are living. Yeah, the story ha. Story is a collection. Ha. It's a gana. Collection, ha. Ha. gana of <laughs> memories. It's a collection of memories, mm -hmm. habits, bundle that you're holding on to. This is your identity. Mm -hmm. This is me. And mm -hmm. I don't want it to be disturbed. Mm -hmm. And the function of physical consciousness is to hold it in place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that you, know, you have a form, you have an identity, and you mm. don't want to easily disturb it. Mm. So now comes the problem. Mm. You have a new idea. Mm. You want to change your even daily routine. Mm. Mm. Whether it is getting up in the morning or changing the food habits or whatever it is. Mm. There is an established rhythm routine over which this is held in place. Mm. Now you have a inspired higher consciousness coming in say now this has to change mm. it won't allow but uh, here it's the mama which told uh, ganesha to hold correct. that is why ganesha is holding correct. now what is the significance of uh, the mother here yeah right because mother is the shakti of uh, the shiva right. and she's herself told it to hold so it's not like by its own right. will Ganesha was not uh, buzzing off. It is because of the orders of right. the Devi herself, of the mother herself. Right. What is the significance of that? So here we need to understand the two different poises of the Divine Mother, hmm. the Shakti. Hmm. One is above and other is below. Hmm. That is in the Supreme Consciousness. Hmm. Other here is she is building up the worlds from below. Mm. There are two mothers. Mm. And here is the nature. Mm. Nature is creating, but in nature, the divine is involved. Mm. Mm. And nature is creating all the forms in order to reveal mm. the divinity. Mm. Mm. So in that process, she is creating forms. Mm. So in that ascending journey, mm. first she has to create stable forms. Mm. On that ground of stable forms is where the life energy, the continuous change, mm. then on the top of it, mind has emerged. Mm. But every time she adds a new layer, mm. it respects the previous layers. Mm. So the first layer is hold, mm. hold forms, mm. Mm. stability, durability, mm. persistence. So there is a form. Mm. But now she has to introduce life into it, mm. where that's where. Uh, Mm. Change and stability has to come together, mm. a dynamic change. Mm. So there is a birth and death and birth and death and there mm. is a continuity of a typal mm. forms, bodily mm. forms, all mm. that. Mm. And there is a progression that is happening in evolution mm. that is all happening. And then there's a mind that is introduced. Mm. So she is progressively building up mm. Mm. and she wants to reveal the divinity in nature. So she has given specific mm principle or rather the force works in a specific way in different levels. Mm. So in the physical she has established you have to hold mm. so that there is a solid stable form mm. Mm. upon which everything else can be mm. built. Mm. Mm. So it, it is from that point of view she has created this mm. Mm. and her higher nature mm. and these two are 
mm. like working together two hands of the divine mother mm. Mm. and from there from higher nature comes the now push things into the next level mm. Mm. so here the lower nature has already given a order now you hold this form mm. now we have a conflict there Hmm. you want to change you have hmm. an established routine it has to be changed hmm. but the nature of the physical consciousness is to hold hmm. now how do we bring these two things together hmm. so this is where the both are nature's workings hmm. one is the higher nature coming and trying to bring in a new into hmm. it hmm. other is the other side of the nature hmm. which is material hmm. nature hmm. a material nature is again measurable part of things gana ganita mm mm now gana is also the mathematic measuring mm gananam calculation mm. it is also everything is measurable in the lower end mm. in the material nature i'd also like to ask like basically the mother had told ganesha to hold right and shiva came and the the child did not recognize that this is my father and at the end of the story the head of ganesha was replaced by the head of eravat the elephant head um why the elephant head and also the significance of the fact that uh, you know ma parvati made the body of ganesha and it is through shiva that came the head of ganesha so that is the second question and then i have the third one which is one layer deeper who is ma parvati who is shiva in their true sense like what do they what do they represent because we are talking about the child of uh, shiva and shakti we are talking about the child of shiva and ma parvati so what do the parents represent because these are all symbolical mm. truths so there is got to be a reason why ganesha is the child of shiva and ma parvati so what do they represent so these are my uh, three questions <laughs> follow up questions okay then we have to really go into the uh, larger framework in order to understand ganesha his birth and this particular conflict that happens mm. so in our uh, indian bharatiya wisdom we see everything is one hmm. there is no male female form nothing it's hmm. pure consciousness pure being sat hmm. hmm. now having said that everything is one hmm. one has to become many hmm. because the manifest world is multitude hmm. so in that process of one becoming many it takes two poises hmm. one is the active other is the passive mm. this is where shiva and shakti come into the picture mm. one is a dynamic force that flows out into creation mm. creates all the forms other is the stage that mm. provides the mm. stability the ground upon which mm. so in terms of consciousness on one hand we have the pure awareness mm. other is the power and the force mm. of that awareness the creative force of that awareness that creates mm. all the forms all mm. the worlds mm. so that is what shiva and shakti represent and which is also we can see in the iconographic language of uh, there is a vertical axis that is immobile mm. then there is the whirling energy that is seen as the shakti that is whirling around mm. the yoni that is dynamic power mm. so there is a clear stability immobile stability that is provided and there is a dynamic energy mm. so the static and dynamic coming together creates all the forms mm. Mm. so now these two have two different extremes one is their their super conscious mm. and where they are consciously Mm. united mm. and in indian mythological context we also refer to this this as he and she mm. creating all the forms ardhanarishra yeah ardhanarishra is a representation of that mm. now at the higher realm mm. they are consciously working mm. together and the same thing is in the lower end it is in the material nature mm. he is involved mm. and she is searching 
mm-hmm. and creating form. So she start creating particles mm-hmm. and to give a form to the her mm-hmm. beloved. Mm-hmm. He, he is involved in her and he's mm-hmm. giving forms. So she creates forms, and this is where the evolution from the below begins. Mm-hmm. And this is where the nature is insert, and this is where the yoga of nature come into the picture. Mm-hmm. it is yoga of nature that is creating the multiplicity the worlds and she is creating newer and newer forms mm. and she has created us and in us the yoga became conscious mm. Mm. but she has all the levels that preceded mm. in evolution where now mind is progressive mm. mind want to progress mm. Mm. but the body's nature is stability mm. it wants to stay because its mandate is to hold mm. Mm. so when the anything that is having the tendency to progress it has to deal with that which want to be stable so in every society in every political system you will find the conservatives and the liberals mm mm those who want to conserve we have to preserve the tradition traditional forms traditional rituals and the other who want to break everything break everything we have to move forward into mm. the new mm. realm so that conflict is inevitable mm. and uh, so shiva time is when when you want to make a change hmm existing forms hmm that is established hmm would resist hmm whether it is your personal habits hmm or collective habits or organizational habits hmm. like you sit put systems and processes in place over a period it run like a machine hmm then if you want to make a change hmm it become increasingly difficult because it's running like a smooth machine hmm on the top of it it become emotional hmm very emotional because i feel safe and stable mm. in the existing system the customs the rituals i don't want to disturb it mm. and when you then the iconoclasts come who break things mm. so there is a battle between the so that. in this story if i can just summarize yeah. it shiva kind of represents the force of transformation and change right and the ganesha represents the force that holds things in its place in his previous In his, before he he, he becomes uh, uh, yeah he before he gets the, the elephant head and yes. before he remembers so what is then the significance of the elephant head which is today it's the elephant head which is how the ganesha is known as right. you cannot have an imagination of ganesha without, without the, the elephant head yeah. it's like it's impossible yeah. right? right so so central to ganesha is this elephant head yeah. what does that represent so this is where the memory come into the picture hmm. elephants are known for memory hmm. they can remember things hmm. they, there are stories legends about elephants hmm. remembering hmm. things and they are emotionally very sensitive creatures and they are also hmm. group hmm. life hmm. and they are powerful beings who moves hmm. quietly removes whatever be the obstacle in front they just remove hmm. so there is a characteristic of the elephant is of that stable powerful energy that is moving steadily and because elephant represents memory and of like really memory of very ancient ancient memories is perhaps that elephant head is a symbol of the physical consciousness remembering the oldest memories of the divine exactly all the way to the deepest depths mm. even prior to that currently for example we have this ritual in maharashtra of immersing mm. now at that time mm. a century ago mm. it was created mm. to bring people together now when you forget the reason for which it is created mm. then it become a social custom mm. Mm. now you cannot change social custom because now this is also presented as hindu dharma yes. and all these things and you cannot touch it you cannot question it it's a religious thing mm. now but it is only 100 years 100 years old mm. prior to that it was a much simpler form now if you have to change it mm. into what is new mm. like in today's world oceans are getting polluted waters and rivers are all getting polluted pollution is everywhere mm-hmm. now we are in the name of religion and spirituality mm-hmm. dumping things into 
oceans and rivers and they are eco friendly ganesha sir are coming now <laughs> yeah. if we have to bring eco friendly ganesha mm mm-hmm. now to connect with nature and harmony mm. we need to remember why this ritual was started in the first place mm. then that emotional reaction can subside so the right knowledge that's why that spiritual knowledge is necessary the remembering for what purpose certain forms rituals were created mm. then it became a habit Mm. now if you have to step out of the habit and become conscious you have to remember why you started in the first place mm. so and all the way back to remembering there is divinity in all things mm. so that we can reimagine mm. rituals ceremonies customs all the inherited protocols so because we can understand the original reason why this were done Mm. Mm. like if you look at the uh, vedic period there were no temples there was no worship of the deities in temples mm. and it was a direct relationship with nature forces of nature mm. and evolution has taken us through all this journey mm. and we have come to a point where now we have to remember mm. nature herself is asking who am i remember me mm. now how how are you dealing with me mm. and uh, so in that process remembrance will become very important remembering our ancient inheritance so recovering the ancient spiritual knowledge in its essence mm. not in its outer form of a ritual mm. it's not conserving rituals as it is mm. it's about going back to the essential truth remembering it mm. then we can recast the forms mm. that is the if i can if i can so to spell this in a another way in a practical psychology it will essentially mean whether it's an individual or as a collective in the habits in the day to day life that we live it's about the remembrance of the divine within that I, am i uh yeah remembrance of the divine and there are forms that are set in place yeah into into the very forms into the very rituals into the inheritance from the past that we have whether at an individual level or at a collective level and many of these things have just become recycled ways of doing things again and again right. and then we begin to mechanically do certain things at an individual level we also begin to do certain things the mechanically mechanism. over yeah. a period of time and also at a collective level it began with a certain uh, a sense a certain purpose. aspiration Conscious a certain purpose. purpose but over time things begin mechanical become right. mechanical and ganesha is that force or that power that brings back the memory of the divinity in that which has become like a habitual pattern form or a habit right it brings back that knowledge yeah of the divinity which is why now when i see that you know when i got attracted to ganesha in my life at that time was the time where it was really the habits which are getting you know reshaped in life of sorts and and to remember that within that also what we you know karmic debts is a very negative sort of a connotation right that even within that there is the divinity that even within that there is the remembrance of the divine yeah that's how i am connecting the dots also to like every cycle of civilization or every few decades things are to change the form has to change the essence has to evolve mm. so if the form has to change the established forms are to be demolished mm. that is the work of the shiva yeah so the established ritual ceremonies customs traditions these are to be demolished or they will break mm. down so okay. and crucial thing to remember is mm. forms must change periodically mm. but the essence has to be retained mm. but we need to remember the essence mm. why we created a form in the first place mm. why we created a system in the first place why we created a rule in the first place mm-hmm. and this happens in the society you create a rule mm-hmm. then you forget why you created the rule mm-hmm. then you blindly follow the rule and imposition of the rule and continuation of the rule why it is so that is how it had been always i want to go back to you know 
two, three more questions are coming to my mind. One is uh, karma, subconscious, Ganesha, relationship between these three. Because karma also, whether it is your personal karma or it is the karma coming from your family, your, that inheritance uh, essentially gets stored into the subconscious. Now, Ganesha as the Lord who presides over the physical consciousness, uh, what role or does he have to play or how one can invoke his presence? And maybe a little bit about, you know, for our viewers, you can also share a little bit about, you know, uh, because there's a lot of misconception around karma itself. It's seen as a bad thing, right. as a punishment. So uh, a little bit around that also. So in light of karma, what is the role of Ganesha? That is one, one question that is coming to me. Second question that is coming to me is, uh, you know, the first time I had read Sri Bindo and the mother, mother speaking of Ganesha as the Lord of spiritual knowledge, that also really, uh, it kind of didn't fit into the imagination that I would have of spiritual knowledge because he's such a cute God. So in my heart, he represents like a lot of love and power. And knowledge kind of gives a certain sense to my mind that it will be a, you know, like a figure of a Maharishi. That is the kind of imagery that comes to my mind. But he's, here is this, you know, with a big belly God, with an elephant head, uh, being represented as the light and force of spiritual knowledge. And over time, I realized that maybe I am interpreting spiritual knowledge as primarily, you know, of the calm intellect. But spiritual knowledge could also be an embodied sense of knowledge. Uh, it could have a sense of simplicity uh, to it, a sense of intuitiveness to it, right? Uh, so these are the two other questions that I have in mind. One is karma, karma uh, subconscious Ganesha, relationship between the three in yoga, and uh, Ganesha as the lord of spiritual knowledge. How, how does one make sense of uh, that? Karma simply means action. Hmm. And for every action, there is a corresponding response in nature. Hmm. So nothing exists in isolation. Hmm. You move something from here, something else moves elsewhere. Hmm. There is a response to it. Hmm. And it is neither negative or positive. Hmm. It is, that's how it is for Every action, there is a consequence to that action. Hmm. Now, when it comes to all the way down to material level, these are measurable consequences. Hmm. Like physics hmm. deals with that measurable domain where there is action, reaction, consequences very much visible. Hmm. Now, when you get to psychological domain, hmm. same principle is applicable, but it is much more fluid. Hmm. There is action reaction happening mm. and there is a formations habits all formed as a result of certain cons repeated actions mm. for example all our habits are result of mm. certain repeated action mm. in certain way and mm. that will be held by the subconscious mm. as a formation it is formed now i will hold you have given it to me mm. so i will hold it mm. because that is its dharma Mm. Now, if you happen to develop a bad habit, mm. it will hold. If you happen to develop a good habit, it will hold. It doesn't care. Just like gravity doesn't differentiate whether you are a sinner or a saint. If you jump from a building, gravity will do the, exactly the same thing to the same uh, whoever you are. Mm. It's impersonal. In that way, all these forces of nature are pretty much impersonal. Mm. It doesn't care what is your particular mm. status in society, nothing. Hmm. It just runs automatically in an impersonal way. So, karma can be positive, it can be negative hmm. on one side. On the other side, we have inherited karma. Hmm. 
one is parental inheritance mm. like what we inherit from the gene pool of a particular region where we took birth that is our outer mm. social inheritance mm. then there is a other inheritance that is the soul brings through the previous cycles the the positive light that soul brings and also probably there is a karma that if you are holding let's say a family together and if you're the primary person holding and you're empathetically really holding everybody right. together you that to formation also... that habitual formation of a family mm. handed over generation after generation that i'm not just talking about generational mm-hmm. i am talking about even let's say organization you're running an office forget a family but you're running an office with a sense of ownership and responsibility and with a sense of empathy in with a sense of a deep connection with people and you tend to absorb something of that stuff right uh into yourself and you process that as well so one is a lot of times it is seen that the one who's processing any kind of karma has done some negative karma that is why you're processing karma so whereas it could be seen in the other way round also it is uh people who have the power to process certain karma will probably also receive certain karma and it's a work that they quietly do on behalf of you know the larger lineage whether it is of the family or the organization or the collective one that one is holding and uh yeah like can you speak of karma in that kind of a context also because there is a lot of misunderstanding around karma oh you know this is happening with you you must have done something wrong in the past right it is kind of seen like that whereas the other perspective is you know the other day i was listening to somebody and he was saying that the pitru dosh or you know that karma comes to the ones who are usually good hearted because they are empathetic and they tend to receive right and in as a part of the yoga if one brings light within oneself it's like one brings light into the world and a lot of times in the beginning you know one feels oh the path of yoga is so beautiful and so hunky dory right and uh, one does meet at some point in time in life where one has to face the subconscious where one has to enter the patal lok right nobody has known heaven without traveling through hell right and if one has known heaven without traveling through hell then it means it's a very superficial heaven it's not a real heaven for that matter right so one i want to sort of understand in that kind of a context and second uh you no know, why do, why does that happen in in yoga itself and then you know the significance of ganesha within that uh, context here uh... here is where we need to distinguish between the yoga of transformation and the yoga of liberation hmm. if it is a yoga of individual liberation you are not dealing with the collective and its stuff inheritance collective karma and all that thing hmm. what you are looking at is what is the shortcut by which you can exit hmm. so there this issue doesn't exist you only have to deal with your what your personally is holding within the body and even that you try to reject and exit hmm. it is when it comes to the collective yoga and transformation of the collectivity there this battle become relevant mm. and the greater the capacity that you have greater the battles that are given to you mm. whether it is a family context or a social context any change maker mm. any transformer anyone who is bringing social transformation mm. has to meet the existing formations within the society mm. and similarly when you are taking birth in a particular society particular family or a society soul is coming with a particular mission mm. if it is an advanced soul mm. and then you are waking up and you are remembering mm. you have something to do this is not okay this is not okay you want to make a change mm. and then you re- rediscover the path of yoga and then you enter into the path mm. then the stuff will show up mm. to be dealt with hmm these things are to be dealt with and there is a strong mm. opposition that battle mm. the father and son battle will repeat mm. Mm. until the collectivity or that which is habits or the formations will remember mm. why these things were set in place in the very first place what is the original intention 
because at the source of things, everything was done with a good intention. Mm. It's like old saying, no? the mm. path to hell is laid with good intentions. <laughs> this is a very, very, very good point that you're bringing. Uh, when I was processing some of these things, one thing that came to me is that uh, even though it was a very difficult situation that I was a part of, but I went back to everybody's intentions. And so everybody's intentions were pure. The entire, you know, uh, thing uh, felt like a betrayal or whatever it felt like at the end of, end of the story of this tough period that I went through. But I saw that in the sense, every character who's a part of the story actually has that good intention. Even if one is acting out of ill will, one is not consciously acting out of ill will. It is a bit like, you know, some people have a habit of hackling on the streets uh, with the uh, street vendors. It's not like they don't want street vendors to grow or, you know, they, they wouldn't say hackle in a showroom, but they will hackle on the road. But it's because it's their habit. It's not like they're intending to harm the street vendors. Mm -hmm. That's not the intention, right? So for me also, it really came down to this point that in its origin, what may feel like a difficult uh, karmic situation, uh, at its root, everybody had good intentions uh, from wherever they are in their stage of evolution. And uh, in some ways, Ganesha is a remembrance of... Uh, yes, that. this is where that spiritual knowledge come into the picture. Mm. What is the spiritual knowledge? What are the values in conflict? Mm. In any difficult challenge, mm. we remove outer details. Mm. Go to the source. What was the original intention? What are the original values in conflict? Mm. And which value is to be prioritized? Mm. Mm. That is the remembrance that is required. Mm. And that is why uh, spiritual knowledge. Right. Yeah. Now that kind of ties. Yeah. Like. Because the values are universal and that comes directly from the soul. Mm. And once things are set in motion, it become an outer form, a ritual protocol, then it solidifies, crystallizes, and then at one point it has to be demolished. Mm. Because that form is no more relevant, value is still relevant. Mm. So we have to demolish the value and go back to the original intention and the values, universal mm. values. So once you touch that which is universal, then you can discard the form and recreate a new form. Mm. That's where Ganesha come into the, can you go back to the original intention, even looking at even the most difficult character. Because mm. the most difficult obstacle mm. is standing out there. Mm. Behind it, who is it? Mm. What is the deepest intention behind it? Mm. Even so-called enemy. Mm. What is the deepest intention? What is the light behind all these things? Mm. That remembrance and that seeing that it removes the obstacle immediately. Mm. Whether it is personal difficulty, collective that difficulty. That's why Vigna, Vigna ah. mm. So that obstacles, in order to remove the obstacle, we need to recognize the divinity behind that. Mm. So I would like to now ask you to, you know, because you covered quite a lot of territory and I took you, you know, into <laughs> karma, into different, different tangents also. But really, if you had to sort of summarize, right, Ganapati is the lord of the Ganas and the symbology of Ganesha that, that we experience, how would you sort of summarize? So last few words to you to just help our viewers sort of understand the essence of what we talked about today. So we have to look at in the context of progress. We are here in the process of yoga and in the yoga we have to make progress and there are always obstacles mm. on the way. And those obstacles are to be removed. Mm. Now, in order to remove the obstacles, mm. we have to remember mm. why this obstacle is in the first place. Mm. Why somebody is opposing you, why somebody is appearing to be an opposition, mm. and why certain customs refuse to change. Mm. And can you remember 
the very essential truth of it. Mm. Can you acknowledge the essential truth of it? Mm. Then there is a possibility of unwinding and removing that. Mm. And here comes bonding over food. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> the modak. Modak come into the picture. Can you come together, mm. sit together, eat together mm. and understand in that sweetness of relationship. Mm. Like what was, why are you <laughs> in such a mm. uh, conflict? Mm. Mm. And what is it that you are preserving, protecting, fighting for? Mm. Mm. And in that there is an opening possibility mm. of transforming that obstacle and becoming again what used to be the conflict can again cluster and become a larger whole. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. So that is the essential truth what we need to remember. Mm -hmm. There is a very well-formed uh, something or other in action in the world and which you need to change. Mm -hmm. In order to change, you need to have the permission of the deity who is holding it. Mm. And deity behind it is the Ganesha. Mm. And who has the right knowledge of why this was put in place in the first place. Mm. The divine origin of things. Mm. And if we can touch that, invoke him, mm. the right remembrance, mm. right memory, and then... Can one also say in some ways, because Ganesha is associated with the Muladhara, that when one gets into overthinking, anxiety, because anxiety is today the malice of uh, yeah. uh, the masses, right? Almost everybody is talking about, I'm anxious, I'm anxious, I'm anxious. Anxiety, you know, there was a joke that I read that if I step out of the house, I'm anxious. If I'm in the house, then I'm depressed. So really, I mean, this is something a lot of uh, people are struggling with. So can one say that, you know, invoking Ganesha, because anxiety is like really overworking of the mind and if one has to ground oneself and come to the root you know then invoking the ganesha is also really helpful bringing the stability for, uh, uh, bringing yeah. the stability and in order to have the stability we need to go beyond the perception of the duality hmm. that is ganesha brings that perception all is hmm. his parents Mm. Yeah, him, Ganesha, seeing his parents in the universe, which is a very common imagery. Right. Yeah. So th this, the whole universe is nothing but your parents. Mm. Yeah. It is no, like you are fighting against an enemy out there, mm. a danger out there. Mm. And the whole media is rushing on danger out there. Third world war is coming, economy is collapsing, ecology is collapsing. So panic, panic, mm. panic. So... Mm. The anxiety is natural. Mm. Mm. And here we need to bring back into the ground of faith mm. and to know that the divine presiding over all this, mm. there is a rapid transformation happening. Existing forms are collapsing, but there is a new world that is emerging mm. in that having faith and behind all that appears to be an opposition, behind it, who it is. Mm. And remembering that it is your parents. You are in the lap of the divine parents. Mm. So there, your father and mother are there. Otherwise, you are, now you are, uh, my mother said no, and you are out. Mm -hmm. you know? mm. That conflict continuously happening. Mm. So stop that unnecessary battle. And the uh, settling happens when the vision settles. Mm. I am in the lap of the divine mother and father. Mm or the divine being who is presiding over everything, mm. one being. If one doesn't want to see it in terms of duality, say there is nothing but that. Isha, Vasim, Idam, Sarva. Mm. So there uh, you settle mm. and you gain the stability. Mm. With, is there any practice, practical practice, everyday life practice that you would recommend Already, I think the fact that you're talking about going beyond duality in your perception of details of life, and I think details of life are also very, very important. 
uh, any other practice that you would say is good for somebody who wants to invoke the presence of Ganesha in one's life, whether it can be jap japa or chanting or journaling or really, uh, you know, psychologically seeing that this conflict that I seem to be yeah. a part of, where is the divine in it? Where is the Shiva in it? Where is the divine presence in it? Right? What is that one practice that you would recommend to our viewers? In order to establish the stability, mm. there are like, if one up take mantra approach, there is a stoma mantra, which is stoma is to bring stability. Mm. And there it is the repetition. That's where the japa come into the picture. Mm. Like mind and emotions are going all over the place. But if you have a japa, mm. then it goes Mm. round and round and round and round and round and it creates the form mm. and it becomes stable. Mm. So if we want to deal with the physical consciousness and bring certain rhythmic stability into it, mm. Japa is the simplest, best way to establish that. Mm. Otherwise, mind is going all over the place. Mm. Put the mind to job. Like embedding it into the physical consciousness, into the very cells of the body. Exactly. And so that every cell of the body remembers God. Exactly. Exactly. It is to be imprinted into it and then you have the stability. Mm. So that you're not jumping around. You're not swept off by the drama of the world. Mm. Any particular mantra or japa that you would recommend? No. Mm -hmm. Each one. <laughs> that each one has to find. Here again, mantra... Japa, these things need not be in the form of Sanskrit. Mm. Something that is really touching your heart, a phrase, mm. whether it is Sanskrit, English, any other language, just holding that. Mm. But I feel like having a Sanskrit mantra mm. also is something very beautiful and something that, uh, like for, for me in my journey, at different phases of my life, I have gotten attracted to this different mantras. And without even knowing the meaning of what that mantra is, and you know, not even trying to find out the meaning of it at that particular stage in life, when I started to be attracted to certain mantras, that mantra was working in me. And it's much later that I understood, oh, why I was getting attracted to that particular mantra. I was just playing it on loop in my home, in my office, everywhere I was just playing it on loop. And I understood why I was getting attracted to it much later when I studied that particular mantra and I understood the meaning of that particular mantra from a Sanskrit uh, root sound uh, perspective. It really blew me away. So while, yes, it need not be in Sanskrit, but I do feel like Sanskrit has a yeah. power that... What we need to look at is what is naturally coming to you. Mm. Mm. Because yeah. unless your deepest heart lovingly hold, mm. it will not be effective. Mm. So if Sanskrit or any other phrase that is coming mm. to you and when you hold it, mm. that will begin to open up mm. and reveal its knowledge, its power, and eventually embody what it mm. represents. Mm. That idea behind it become active power in our being. So that's a uh, <laughs> good journey, good, uh, good explorations. Thank you. And uh, yeah, I found it very, very meaningful that clarity that came you know by the end of the conversation that Ganesha is the remembrance of the divine into the very details of one's being that remembrance in any conflict in any loop of thought that we are thinking in any loop of feeling that we are feeling mm. remembering going at the very core of that feeling mm. going to the very core of that thought and discovering that tattva of Shiva, discovering that tattva of the Divine Father, discovering that tattva of the Divinity within it. I think that was for me the biggest takeaway from this conversation. Really thank you for uh, coming here today and uh, sharing with us this very deeper psychological yogic perspective on understanding Ganesha and the process of uh, sadhana. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so thank much. You. We come to the end of the podcast. We hope you found the podcast to be useful. If you found it to be useful, please share, subscribe and like the video. Please also share in the comments below. 
as to what really in the podcast touched you, moved you, what insight did you have and also what are some of the other topics you would like us to cover in the videos going forward. With that, once again, wishing you a very, very happy Ganesh Chaturthi. We are also now going to be sharing with you a small dance, a small snippet of a little dance I did as an ode to Ganesha. Enjoy. Enjoy and make sure you don't leave without subscribing to the Purnam community channel. Wish you a beautiful Ganesha Chaturthi.